my name is Amber and I'm definitely a perfectionist. So this picture was actually taken in 2018 when I was first learning how to code with Code First Girls. So I actually come from an economics and accounting background and that was my first introduction. And I remember feeling like my perfectionist was holding me back. So it was actually holding me back in several ways. And I saw it later on where I eventually started teaching other women how to code through the same organization. But my perfectionism made me not want to contribute, not ask, ask, ask any questions, answer any questions. And it essentially held back my progress. I used to think that perfectionism was a good thing because it meant that I had high expectations of myself. But unfortunately, that isn't the case. So I want to differentiate now between the difference between having a healthy pursuit for excellence versus an unhealthy pursuit for perfection. So Brene Brown says it best. Um, so she describes perfectionism as an unhealthy and addictive belief system that fuels this primary thought. So if I look perfect and I do everything perfectly, then I can minimize the feelings of blame, judgment and shame. And when I first heard that, I felt like this. I felt like, wow, she's personally come to attack me today. No one had actually um, said it in a way that deeply resonated with me. And I didn't realize that those were the underlying thoughts I had that was actually holding me back from living up to my true potential and actually being open to learning. So one thing that I really take on now is that the journey of a thousand miles begins with that single step. And even though that single step for me was with Code First Girls and but struggling with these thoughts of me not living up to my expectations or what if I'm not good enough and not really put myself out there, it always starts with something. And that's what keeps me going now. So I've developed my own signature framework. I've said that there's no right or wrong method, but this is the right method for, for me. And so it's an acronym going through recognizing your thoughts, um, building an intervention toolkit, developing a growth mindset, asking for help, and also tracking your wins. And this is what works for me. So when we're recognizing our thought patterns, um, we're gonna talk through the thoughts, feelings, fears, and behaviors that we may exhibit. So these are a few kind of thoughts that I've looked up to really help with myself. And also when I'm mentoring other women in tech that have had similar struggles that I had um, when coming up into the industry. So black and white thinking. So this involves thinking one extreme or the other. So some people would say things, should I do front end or back end or should I do data or things like that? But you can always combine the two, for example. So say if you like front end and back end, you can do full stack. Um, and just giving yourself room to explore your various different interests. That's why I like the whole idea of a graduate scheme because you're able to move through rotations, but also giving them the space to actually explore their different interests, work out what they're good at and what they're not. And the mental filter. So this is especially true when we get feedback. Sometimes we can do one thing, like several things right. So if there's eight points, seven things that we did well and one thing that didn't go so well, but we focus on what didn't go so well and leaving the meeting feeling deflated and focusing on that rather than recognizing that 90% of that feedback was actually very good. And then catastrophizing. So I would call myself the CEO of catastrophizing because that's exactly what I do a lot. So it'd be a case where if something failed, I'd feel like, okay, so if um, I can't present um, a, a something that I'm building in terms of like a little um, coding project that the the laptop is going to set off on fire and everything's going to go crashing down and the reality that just wasn't the case but it felt very real at the time and then looking to the feelings that were also holding me back so that self-doubt thinking that okay I'm not able to accomplish this and it's too hard or the anxiety feeling that okay so I'm not necessarily good enough and I feel quite panicked to even take the step especially going from a non-traditional background into something technical, it can be very, very daunting to step into that new space and also to learn something completely different. And also those feelings of overwhelm. I'm not sure how many of you come from non-technical background. Can I get hands up for non-technicals? Woo, 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 love to see it. So you may be able to resonate when I say it can be very overwhelming and the resources out there are a lot. And so I would say stuff like, I'd, look, I'd Google stuff like, how do I become a software engineer? And it's like this, 20 threads like on Twitter saying all the stuff that you need to learn felt absolutely impossible especially when I was starting before I was ready by applying for jobs and getting just oh just the feedback let's just say that and then also identifying the fears 
So one fear that I see a lot in people is that fear of failure. And also um, what's not spoken about that much surprisingly is the fear of success. So if we do actually land that first role in our technical fields, what if we can't match up to the expectations that they um, put onto us? And also the fear of being exposed. I definitely felt this when I was applying for jobs and I felt like, what if they asked me a question that I don't know the answer to? And the reality is that did happen. And I have to say, I'm sorry, I'm not sure of the answer to that, but I'm keen to learn still. Um, the fear of being judged and criticized, especially when you put yourself out there and doing something different, fear of not being good enough. So I remember when I was applying for jobs, and if I got if I got a rejection, if it didn't go to plan, it would reinforce this belief that I had that I just simply was not good enough to step into this industry and maybe I should do something more suited to my degree in economics and just go back to finance. The fear of change and the fear of wasted time and resources. So what behaviours does this lead to? So definitely procrastination. When you're riddled with feelings of self-doubt and anxiety, you may not want to take that step forward into doing the things that you actually want to do, which of course in my case was um, going into software engineering and overthinking and just overanalyzing all the things that stopped you from actually taking the action and blaming others. This is something I didn't necessarily do at the time, but it felt like I was in control of other people seeing me for having the potential to actually step into space and actually believing in me to give me that one chance. Um, so I was going to do a reflection exercise about taking three minutes to write down your thoughts, feelings and behaviours that may that you may be struggling with, but we're going to skip that just because of time. Um, so this is my favourite part, which is all about the, um, having an intervention toolkit. But we have to first talk about toxic positivity, and that is the belief that you're not allowed to feel any emotion, less than any emotion, any negative emotion, and it puts a pressure on you to only feel positive things, which is not realistic because at the end of the day, we're all humans. So one thing that I always talk about is, okay, so now I'm like, okay, I've got my mindset together, I'm recognizing my thoughts, and now I'm going to take the action. So a great example I like to talk about is when me and my boyfriend went to wakeboarding. And if you haven't been wakeboarding, essentially you have, it's a water sport, you have a board, you put your knees on, and essentially you're dragged around almost like water skiing, but like on your knees, right? And so I'm just breathing in, I'm at the deck and I'm just like, she's gonna push me and I'm just gonna go. So I'm there, I'm breathing, I'm just like, I'm ready. And then she, she pushes me off. And then I'm pulled and I didn't, one, I didn't realize how fast it was. And two, I didn't realize how much upper strength you had to have, which I did not have. And so literally, I think I lost about maybe four seconds. I let go, I go face first into the water. My board's flying up. I actually remember that fact that I signed a waiver saying I can swim and I actually can't. And I thought that I literally was about to drown. So imagine I fall off the board, I'm under the water now. Thank God we have a life jacket. So I'm up, I'm up on the water. And on top of that, there's a person behind me and they say that if someone's in the water, you need to dodge them. I start screaming because I think I'm actually going to die. And then I have to try and swim out of the water onto land. Um, and I say, OK, that was hard. That was embarrassing. But, you know, that's the worst of it. It wasn't because as I'm walking, someone says, oh, my gosh, it was so funny. I saw you fall and scream. Everyone heard you. And I was just like, let me fail in peace. OK, <laughs> let me fail in the privacy. But it was good because it helped me to actually just laugh about it sooner than I could have. But I want to say that when you're adopting these kind of things to start before you're ready, it doesn't mean that things are going to go well. Things can go badly, but it's about your ability to bounce back and recover from it. So I had to address that first because I don't think it's spoken about enough. So here are a few mindset changes that I had to make and I teach other people to make. Um, so it's about th saying things like, there's so much to do and I don't know where to start. That is very relatable and it's very valid. And I challenge you to say, what's the smallest step that I can take to bring me towards my goal? Things like I'm not doing anything with my life, which is definitely how I felt during the pandemic, was I'm doing the best with the time and energy and resources that I have at this current time. And I don't know how, you know, sometimes like we spoke before about blaming others. I don't know how, but empower yourself and be like, I can learn how by seeking help and asking others. Um, one thing that I hear a lot is if I fail, it means I'm a failure, but I, failure is not who you are. It's something that you experience and I'm too scared to make the change. So it means I can't do it. Everything that I've done in my life has been very scary, including that wakeboard experience. It didn't mean I couldn't do it. It meant that I could still do it, feel the fear and do it anyway. 
and feeling so alone working on this project, looking into communities to help, because that makes a huge difference. You don't have to do it alone. So in the intervention, inter, in the intervention talk here, I talk about short-term and long-term strategies. So if you're feeling quite overwhelmed, you feel stressed, and you're overanalyzing, one thing that I like to do straight away is take an intentional break, especially when my code is breaking, which happens like almost all, like every, all the time. Um, I go outside because sometimes when I'm in a room, I feel like my stress and my problems can fill that entire room. So I, can go, so I tend to just go outside and realize that the world is much bigger than like the fact that production isn't running right now. Um, so yeah, so my looking to short-term ideas, like getting outside, writing it down, exercise, meditation, practicing self-compassion, which makes a big difference, and gratitude, and long-term things like seeking professional help, investing in a course like Mind Valley, um, reading like self-help books, or even just books that you love in general, actually, and creating positive habits, like practicing gratitude, practicing self-care, and doing activities that increase your self-esteem. And so the reflection exercise is what are you adding to your intervention toolkit? I normally do these online, um, but I'll challenge you, does anyone want to share something that they would add? <laughs> it's all good, it's all good. We're going to talk about the G now, which is the growth mindset. So this is a term coined by Dr. Carol Dweck, who is an American psychologist. And it's essentially the idea that you can develop skills and talents through hard work, the right strategies and guidance from others. So, so often, like even I used to think when I was first learning how to code, that people were just, they woke up one day and they just had this ability to be able to code rather than me um, just having to learn it on the fly. The reality is that people are, um, people do have innate skills, but you also have the ability to learn new skills as well. And that's the whole point of the growth mindset. So people with growth mindset tend to discount obstacles and use them as learning opportunities. So for me, when I was doing my first coding interviews and things were going absolutely wrong. So sometimes I'd be pairing and I wouldn't have done the, um, the language before, or sometimes people would ask me a question I wouldn't know the answer to. I actually flipped it on its head because at the end of the day, I knew that I wanted to become a software engineer. So I use that as learning opportunity. So in my interviews, I would actually just write out the questions afterwards and make sure that I was even stronger for my next for my next interview. So I remember I was asked about Git commands and I was just using the GUI. Like I did not know about Git push, Git pull or anything of any Git commands. I remember like she was like, can you name me some? And I said, I'm, just, I'm sorry, I actually just, I can't. And that's when I realized that I really actually had to learn about how to use the terminal. I just did not think that devs would use a terminal. I was just doing it manually. And looking back, I don't know how I did that because I use it all the time. But yeah, just using all your um, failures as eventual learning opportunities, even if it doesn't feel it at the time. And for the H is asking for help. This is something that I really struggle with in general to ask for help. But I feel like the most times I've been lonely is when I haven't need into community and community has been so powerful for me. So things like Code First Girls, Coding Black Females, Girl Dreamer, The Stack World, Babes and Waves, Triangles. As you can see, I'm a part of a lot of communities and they've helped me so much in my journey to build confidence, land those interviews and essentially empower me to carry on and do the things that I do now. And also to track your wins. The most times I've been feeling those big bits of imposter syndrome is because I hadn't been tracking all the steps I've been taking towards my goals, whether they're big or small. So this is something I'm super, super passionate about. And I give, I give free tips to track your wins. Do not discount the small wins. So even things like I applied for one job or I even got out of bed today, that can be an achievement for you and have visual aid. I don't know why I was like saying, oh my gosh, I'm doing absolutely nothing with my life. And I went through my pictures and I just saw that one success is how you define it. And secondly, I actually am doing things in my life. And for me to have that visual aid is such a help and setting up monthly or weekly um, wind checkers to check in on. That's what I did during the pandemic. Cause I don't know if you remember during the pandemic, I felt like time was just blurred into each other. So it felt like one month felt like, I don't know, like two days sometimes, or sometimes it was the other way around. So setting up that monthly tracker helped me to realize that I'm actually doing things, I'm making a difference and I'm making those strides towards my goals. And yeah, so that's essentially um, the right method broken down. And yeah, thank you for listening. This is great. We're going to do, um, yes, 
So um, there is a Slido link. If you use the QR code, you can put some questions in Slido. We'll also be taking questions um, from the floor as well. I have one to get us started. So um, when you were speaking about your graduate scheme and or, or the fact that not your graduate scheme, that graduate schemes give people a chance to rotate, how would you recommend people find that later on in their career, I suppose, if they don't want to go back to the beginning? Oh, yeah, um, I'd recommend just... I do a lot of things outside of work. So I just recommend exploring your interests and maybe doing like a project outside of work, join a community. So for example, if I wanted to get into data right now, I'd find some data communities and connect with people and maybe try to build products with them or pick their brains and work out what kind of things that they do to have that exploration, but not, especially if you don't have the time to commit full time to doing this. So yeah, just exploring it outside of your day job and your working hours. Yeah, somewhere like this. <laughs> yeah, somewhere like this, exactly. <laughs> Please do feel free to take a seat. Um, we'll also open the floor to questions if there's anyone in real life who has a question, or you can go on Slido as well. Oh, fabulous. We have one. Uh, so, can you say uh, about when things uh, hi. Uh, so you talk about joining communities, but where do you start to look for them? Like, where do you find them? Oh, yeah, I find them. So some people post them on LinkedIn, so I'll find them through there. I always go on meetup.com. I always, because the thing is, sometimes someone will ask, how did you find us? And I always say, I'm not actually sure, because I'm chronically online. That's my problem. Um, so, yeah, so I go on meetup.com. I go on LinkedIn. Um, I will just type in, or sometimes um, people say it on chat saying that, I'm going to go to this event, for example. Yeah, meetup.com is really, really good for any kind of community meetups that you see. But I also see it on TikTok. I see it on Instagram. It's it's pretty much everywhere. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. It's all good. That's fab. So diversifying where you find things. Yeah, exactly. Exactly that. Perfect. Um, the next question that we have is how do you track your wins? I know that you mentioned, of course, you take photos for people who maybe do not have as many photos on their phones etc how would you track your win would you have an excel spreadsheet how how else could you do i that? used to have an excel spreadsheet but that was just not sustainable for me um at all i do not like excel i do not like the alternatives i will be honest um but so i just used i have a journal so at the back of the journal i'd write september for example i'd date it and write down the win that way. And so I would just flick through, I'm like, you know, I'd be having my panic attacks, like I'm not doing anything. So I'd run to the journal, <laughs> flick through that page and see, okay, what was, what have I been doing this month? So yeah, it can be visual, it can be in a journal, it can be on, on Excel if you want it to. So yeah, you can diversify the way that you track it. But that's how I personally track mine. Perfect. Um, please do continue sending in the questions on Slido. So um, somebody mentioned, I'm similar to you, just career change through CFG from a non-tech background. What were some of the biggest challenges you faced in the first year of your role? Oh my gosh, I love this question. Okay, one, virtual onboarding. Virtual onboarding was just, it's just never a vibe. You just feel like you're just a, just, it's very hard to feel integrated into your team in a virtual environment. So that was like the first thing. Um, the second thing was learning a complete different language. So I used to be a Python girl. I used to love me a bit of Python. I thought it was delicious. And so going into my first role, and it was a front-end role, not only did I have to tackle the beast that I thought JavaScript was, I had to learn React. And also as a perfectionist of extremely high standards, um, I wanted to feel like I could contribute straight away. So there's a lot of problems within that. The first thing was taking time out and giving myself the self-compassion to learn those languages. And the second thing was to not put too much pressure on myself and comparing why I do not compete by looking at the senior engineers who seem to know everything and wanting to be that with my two months of experience. So that was one thing. Um, I think that I didn't reach out enough and ask for help. Um, reaching out to people and knowing who to reach out to makes a big difference. I always say to find the plug. And there's a plug in every single company. And the plug is a person that's been at the company for a long time and knows everyone and their talents. So they can direct it. They're almost like a human directory. So <laughs> that's what I like to call them. So fortunately, in my first role, I had the plug was the director of my team. And he said, reach out to this person if you have issues with Git. If, reach out to this person if you want to know about accessibility. Reach out to this person if you want to know about CSS. And he just seemed to know everyone and their talents. And that was amazing. 
Um, another thing was I didn't get as involved into the networks as I could have. So at Amex, so my first role was at Amex and now I'm at Skyscanner. But at Amex, they had loads of different networks. They had women's network. They had like um, LGBT networks. And I didn't get that involved in them. And I wish that I did because you, it gives you that sense of community, especially if you're um, onboarding online or your team may not be based in your city. So that was a very long-winded answer, but that is my answer. <laughs> Thank you. So um, the next question that we have is actually in an event like this, like DevLab, what is the best or appropriate way to ask if a job is available and network in person? I'm sure this will come in handy as we have networking um, very shortly. Yeah. So so if you're looking for a role, um, I'm always very open. I would just say, hey, how are you doing? Um, I'm currently, this is currently what I'm looking for. So I'd say that oh, I'm currently looking for like um, a software engineer to role. Um, is your company hiring right now? I would just be open and just say, this is what I'm looking for rather. Are you hiring? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I'll just take a break here to see if anyone else in person would have any questions. That we'll continue going. Oh. Hi, um, thanks very much for the presentation, by the way. I'm, I'm also a career changer. Um, and currently struggling with just the market being very, very difficult when you don't have any professional experience. So my question is, do you do you put any value in like those professional certifications that you can kind of like the IBM stuff or the AWS things or are they, are they worth doing in them? Because it feels like I'm just waiting for the market to get better before somebody will hire me with straight out of the boot camp. Um, so what's your view on that sort of extracurricular stuff? OK, very, very good question. And I remember, so fortunately, this question actually applies because I was applying for the job during the pandemic and we all know the job market back then. It was an absolute hot mess. Um, so one thing I focused on was what are my competition doing? So that are, that's anyone with a computer science degree. So one thing that I saw some people were doing was teaching. So I said, okay, I'm going to start teaching with Code First Girls. There was a, it was a good way, it was a good thing to do for two reasons. One thing, because it's always good to give back to community. Two, second thing is teaching accelerates your learning on a complete different level. And three, it communicates to employers that this is something that you're really, really interested in. Um, it can be hard to get that buy-in when you don't have that computer science degree to back you up. But if they see that you're doing these extracurricular things outside of work or outside the norm, then it makes a big difference in terms of you standing out. And if you have the time, definitely do those certs. It also should communicate to employees that you're serious and you're keen to learn. But yeah, I would just focus on doing anything that can make you stand out from a typical application and just making sure to communicate that as best as you can on your CV. There's so many times people were sending me their CV and it says like what they previously did rather than all the things that they're learning. So you may not have a computer science degree, but you are doing this course or you are doing these certs and make sure that the right keywords being picked up by the CV generators. So yeah, that, that's my advice. Fabulous. So the next question is based around mentorship. Do you think mentorship is valuable or do you think more value comes from being part of a wider community to hear from a range of different people? Ooh, that is a very good question. Who asked that? Um, so um, I'm going to say that mentorship has made a huge difference um, because it gives you the insight into the industry and it also allows you to ask questions in a safe space. So I have had various different mentors throughout my career and I still do have mentors. So one I found the most beneficial was having a technical mentor. So someone that I can actually pair program with and learn on the fly. So the best mentor that I still have is one that is very good at CSS. I don't know how. I'm, I'm still trying to I'm trying to absorb that because CSS is definitely my weakness. And so it's great to be able to pair with him on various different products projects and um he teaches me a lot in terms of um my building on my technical abilities but also there have been mentors that have helped me with interviews and getting um I don't know just teach me a lot about computer science fundamentals and stuff that I can apply to both at interview but also within my day job as well and I think that being part of a wider community helps you to feel less alone and also gives you great networking opportunities. So if you're able to communicate that, hey, I'm a career switcher and I'm looking for my first role, um, you can be the first person that they think of if they ever hear of anything. So I wouldn't say it's one thing or the other, it's definitely both. Perfect. Um, and another question from myself, actually, based on the current climate of, as we've seen, there've been many layoffs, et cetera, recession, how would you go about negotiating a salary increase? 
be audacious. Um, I always say, don't ask, don't get. So again, with the toxic positivity, right? Like we may not want to do it because it may not go well, but the same, that is the same um, result as if you don't ask. So I would always say to ask anyway, and if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Um, but yeah, it's always just to be audacious and ask. Perfect. Um, and on to another question. How do you make yourself attractive to employers to first get an interview at the start of switching from non-tech to tech? Um, I would definitely say to put yourself out there. Something that made a big difference for me was um, posting a lot about my journey online on LinkedIn um, and then people being able to see the fact that this person is really, they're, they're doing the projects, they're, they're networking and stuff like that. Um, so I'm distracted now. What did you, what's the question? Um, the question was, how do you make yourself attractive to employers at the beginning? Yeah, yeah. And just basically communicating all the things that you are doing. Sometimes we think that no one's going to care if I'm doing this course, but it, it makes a big difference to see on your CV that you are at least transitioning into tech, especially if you if your current role is not a technical role at all. Fantastic. Now, um, moving on to the debate about larger or smaller companies, what which one would you say you get more value working from personally? And what would you recommend to um, people who are just starting out as well? Oh my gosh, this is a really hard question because I actually don't know the answer to this. So I started off at a big company and I think that it gave me a lot of um, space to take time out and to learn big big like it's they don't put too much pressure on you to deliver whereas some people that I know that started off at a smaller company felt that pressure to add value straight away and almost that they were a burden on their team for not being able to contribute straight away I'm not sure how much that's actually a team expectation or us just inflicting that like um, expectations onto ourselves so I can't actually answer that and I think that it's personal for the individual um, so for me, I started off at a big bank and then because I wanted something a lot more fast paced because there's a lot of red tape in a big organization, that's when I went to a startup and I had a really, really good time there. And I felt like I learned the most in my short time there. But would I say that coming as my first dev role into a startup would have been a good idea for me? I don't know, but I also don't think so. <laughs> Not for me personally. And now I'm at like more of a mid-sized company. It's got the best of both worlds. So for me... I would be interested in people who started their first dev role at like a middle-sized company because I think that that's like a really nice fit. That's a really good answer. And um, just as a note, whether it's your first, second, third, fourth, whoever knows jobs, um, we have plenty of our sponsors here who are ready and available to talk to you during the breaks as well. So if you have any questions about um, what it would be like to join, et cetera, you can always ask them as well. Moving on to one of our final questions before we have a break for lunch. Um, this question is based around leaving a company. Would you say it's undesirable for your brand to leave after six months, even if, for example, you may not actually be enjoying the work? I left after there? eight and I loved it there. <laughs> so yeah, so my first one, I left after eight months and it was weird because I actually loved it there, but I just felt like I really wanted something a lot more fast paced and I wanted more responsibility. And you know, when you're asking for something, they say, slow down. Maybe they were right because I did go full steam ahead at the startup. Um, so I would say that if you're in a toxic work situation um, and you're not getting the learning opportunities that you desire and um, you may have a backup option, you've applied for a new company, I would say just leave. Like it's it's actually fine. I felt like employers would care a lot more than they did. But again, there's a lot of people that you can ask in this room. I'm very much like leave, but um, <laughs> some people would say to stay for longer. I personally think that life is too short to be miserable for another six months, especially if it's really not serving you and it's toxic or you have a better opportunity. Then yeah, I would just say go. Thank you. And if you are looking for your next opportunity in tech, of course, please do remember to sign up to hackerjob.com. Um, but for our final question, I suppose this one's to do with improving ourselves. Somebody has asked, how is it that we can improve ourselves if we don't get any feedback from employers after being rejected in interviews? Normally, a lot of companies don't actually provide any feedback. I know it's very frustrating, um, but this is where like mentorship comes really well in hand, like in handy. So sometimes a mentor can even go through your CV with you. You can you can walk through some of the interview questions that you had and your answers, and they can provide you with great insights into areas that you can improve in. It really sucks when you apply for a role and they don't give you any feedback. But just um, again, lean into community and ask 
for, for any help that you can get in terms of what is there any improvements I can make, any tweaks that I can do. And it also depends on where in the interview stage you're talking about. So I remember um, when I was applying initially, I was re rejected at CV stage a lot because I did not have those right keywords. And it took me asking a mentor saying, okay, what am I doing wrong here for them to be <laughs> to rip through my CV? But it was a really good learning experience. Mm -hmm. So again, um, one note down where in the interview stage you're struggling with and then seek help and, and get feedback from other people if you can't get that from the people that you're interviewing with.